Well, everyone, I just want to check in briefly, uh, talk about what we're doing this week of Kantianism and utilitarianism. And I called these are traditional ethical decision-making frameworks. And I think that they're very easily sort of understood what it means to approach something as a Kantian or approach something as a utilitarian. And I think that these these simple approaches do serve us in, in, in good stead and something that, that is important for the course and to, to think about. So I thought I'd just say a, a few things about both Kantianism and utilitarianism, just to reinforce the things that are said in the videos, which you should watch. Uh, a Kantian analysis. Now, Kant's moral philosophy is, is quite interesting and it, it rests on the idea that um, moral judgments are, are necessary, right? they're not optional. So that he believes that what makes an action good or bad is whether it's done out of a recognition of duty. So if, if I do something and uh, I do it with a, what he calls a good will, as I do it with a recognition of my obligation to do it. Then, morally speaking, that's all that matters, right? That is that, uh, the, the, the consequences of the action, what actually comes out of the action, what I hope to accomplish through the action is pretty much out of my control and is not relevant when it comes to evaluating the morality of that action. If we look at utilitarianism, it, it is a form of consequentialism in contrast to Kant. Right? Consequentialism says that actions are good or, good or bad according to their consequences, according to the results. And utilitarianism, as a form of consequentialism, says that the results that matter are the ones that impact on human welfare. So that's what the greatest happiness principle or principle of utility says, that actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness wrong as they tend tend to produce the reverse of happiness that, that needs to be significantly um, specified and that's why I gave you the introduction to consequentialism because in itself it doesn't give you much of a guide right to say a few things about utilitarianism right that is that uh, if we say that If we say that, just more or less, the principle says, um, then what is, how do we approach anything as a utilitarian? This is again, where the BBC website on consequentialism, I think helps quite a bit. We're trying to maximize um, Trying to maximize the happiness that's in the world and minimize the unhappiness. And basically, for Mill, and this is a big issue in the book, which we won't go into, but he defends this idea that uh, happiness is pleasure. And unhappiness is pain find them. That's how he defines them. Oops, correct that. So if, if that's our general rule that we're trying to follow, that we're trying to maximize the happiness in, that is in the world and minimize the unhappiness, and as a utilitarian, and whatever I do, I'm trying to figure out what the impacts of my action would be to those around me, to myself and those around me. So um, 
you know, oftentimes, most times, those actions do not affect very many people. But what I'm trying to do is maximize the happiness of those whom they do affect and minimize their unhappiness to uh, create as much pleasure through my actions as I can of the human beings and, and minimize the pain. <clears throat> so that as a basic rule in, in utilitarianism, I think is how we approach things. And it's not easy, right? Because you're, you're trying to anticipate the results of your actions on other people. And sometimes that's quite difficult. A Kantian approaches things in a, an entirely different way. You know, for Kant, the, it's the will behind the action that's relevant in evaluating its moral worth. Now, of course, it matters in the world whether I produce good actions that, that, that help other people and don't hurt them. But as far as morally evaluating those actions, it's the will behind the action that matters. Like the action itself is evaluated morally by the intention by which it's done. And the principle that he comes up with, it's too bad. We don't, we don't really have time to, uh, to follow it out, but uh, the most important uh, concept that emerges here in these readings, at least, is the idea of the categorical imperatives. My screen is is locked because my and <clears throat> I said earlier that for Kant, the um, an, an action is morally a good action if it's done from a good will, and a good will is is. Uh, a will that's prompted by its recognition of duty. And the categorical imperatives can be thought of as tests to see whether what we're doing is um, out of duty, and is, is conformable to duty. And the, the first categorical imperative says basically that whatever I do, it must be universalizable. And the second, that whatever I do very simple rules, <clears throat> I guess. You know, the first one says, well, whatever you do, your rule of action must be capable of being a law for everyone. If it's not, then you know that you shouldn't do it. That is, you know it's not conformable to what your duties are. Uh, the second one says, <clears throat> treat everybody as an end in, in themselves, never as a mere, mere means to one of your ends. So you ask yourself, well, whatever I'm thinking of doing, would it entail treating a person as a means to an end rather than treating them as an end in themselves? If it does, then I know that I can't do it. I know that this action is, is not conformable to what I have a duty to do. And the idea is that these rules are uh, th these rules are exceptionless. Whatever I do, my rule of action, my maxim of action, must be universalizable. If it's not, I can't do it ethically speaking. At least, of course, I can do it, but I can't do it ethically. Um, <clears throat> if I I am not treating any person as an end in themselves, that is, in some way or another, disrespecting them, treating a person like a thing. That is, treating him as a mere means, as an instrument to my own, to, you know, what my object of my desire, then I know that I can't do it, ethically speaking. I can't use somebody as a mere means, as, as only a means to one of my ends. So that's a fairly simple approach, you know, in, in both cases, I think. I mean, in the sense that there, there's something intuitive. Maybe it's not so simple as that it's familiar. You know, there's something intuitively that we recognize in the, in both utilitarianism and in Kantianism, even though they're more or less, I think Kant would say and Mill would say, incompatible uh, moral approaches. But it seems that 
we're already utilizing them in a certain way without maybe knowing that they are part of these philosophies.